Hi, welcome to Indie ETV. I'm Peggy Robinson. Today's guest is Mary Grace Polnastic. Did I say it right? <laughs> Close. <laughs> oh. Will you say it for me? Sure. Polnastic. Okay. And um, where do you live? So I live in Florida, Central okay. Florida area, close to um, SeaWorld or uh, Disney World and all that. Okay. Now you're from Philippines. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. I was born uh, in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was really interested in, um, you sent me your bio, how you was afraid to go outside because people didn't accept you because your family's mixed race, the kids? Well, yeah. And, and back in the late 80s, um, early 90s, um, even though the naval, you know, were readily accepted into the, you know, the naval base in the Philippines, Subic Bay area, uh, mixed children were not as easily accepted. Um, so I'm my dad's, you know, an American and my mom's Filipina. So they kept me inside most of the time. I really didn't have friends screwing up. So yeah, was, fair skinned your, and all that. Uh, was your dad in the military? Yes, he was in the Navy. Mm -hmm. Oh, Navy. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So interesting. Yeah. I just found that interesting <laughs> because I don't know. My heart's always been out there for people that have those issues because I was um, beat up growing up in my adulthood for not being prejudiced because I live in a real prejudiced area. And oh my so, goodness. um, they say, like, if you're friends with them, we will treat you like you're them. So I felt right. like I was them, even though I didn't have the skin color to go with it, you know? Right. Which I think is asinine because in all reality, we're all connected. We're all one. <laughs> you know, we all come from one source. So, <laughs> Right. And you know. my mom told me, now my aunt says it's not true. My aunt that was married to my mom's brother. But my mom told me my grandma's mother was an Indian squall. And I guess that's not politically correct to say squall. I guess that's demeaning, but that's what my mom said. Oh. And, but she didn't want, my grandma didn't want anybody to know it because it was the same as being black. Like you're a stigma. That's weird. They were the first to be in America prior to the Europeans yeah. taking over. But, so that's kind of like you, it was the times, <laughs> you know, this was in yeah. the 60s going into the 70s and you were growing up in the 80s going into the 90s. Right. Oh, yeah, it's crazy. Um, but uh, I was mostly uh, kept inside the house. And I've asked my mom about this several times um, throughout, you know, my adulthood growing up, like, why didn't you just take me to the doctor? Um, when I was really, really sick, I had a very high fever, you know, the like my body was sweating, I was very like frail, and I barely could move because my body whole body was hurting. And she said that doctors didn't believe in possession or spirits or anything like that. So that's why one of the reasons. And it was too expensive to take me to the doctors. So, <laughs> you know, the, they didn't take me to the doctors. So they believed wholeheartedly in their faith, even though they were Catholic, um, that I was possessed instead of, you know, sick with high fever. So Why did they think you were possessed? I'm not sure. Like I was sweating. This um, she said that they had to like put cloth in my head constantly because I was so hot, and that was to them a sign enough to be um of a possession. Because so. you you went outside like during the beginning of your NDE, correct? Like yes, ma'am. So when I was um lying there, um, when I guess when you're on the brink of death, you hear like auditorially or you can see, um, you know, beings. Um, so I was hearing children playing outside. And so even in my sickly, frail state, I got up with all my might to go outside to play with these children, because like I said, I was inside most of my life at that point. So when I went outside, I saw these beautiful children like with golden aura all around them you know and they were laughing and playing and so I wanted to play with them and in my mind's eye I was you know playing tag and stuff um but to my mom's and grandmother's point of view I was like it looked like I was just catching bugs <laughs> <laughs> so yeah and then after a few moments of that I remember just darkness I must have like fallen to the ground or something and I guess at this time they had brought me inside the house 
um, they called some faith healers or shamans, um, whichever wording you want to use, um, to come and exercise, I guess, me. And, um, but in my mind's eye, what was happening inside of me, I was in this blackness, this void. And it's kind of like suspended animation. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I could barely, was like, I didn't know if I could move or not. But nothing hurt anymore. Breathing didn't hurt. My body didn't hurt. I just felt this immense, like, weight lifted off of me. Um, and then I remember, like, a pinpoint of light and then a call. It wasn't like a voice or word or anything. It was just like, ah, you know. <laughs> and then it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And then I was engulfed in that light. And then this amorphous being, like, didn't have any shape or form or anything well kind of like an orb but not really because it moves um you know greeted me and I just sorry but <laughs> I, I still get emotional to this day thinking about it I just felt this immense love and peace in that place like you know because growing up I didn't feel that I just felt like I was there. I was an obligation. I was just taking up space. You know what I mean? I was a burden. And so to feel that type of feeling, that love, that peace was just, in fact, like beautiful, <laughs> you know? And um, they greeted me. And then on the other side of it was um, like other beings. I think it was like a library of some sort because there was a table and then like books on the table and they were reading, but then they stopped for a moment and greeted me. And what I felt from them was just like unconditional love and peace and no judgment, like, <laughs> you know? And um, as five years old, I didn't know what to say because I was still like flabbergasted both where I was. I was like, what's going on here, <laughs> you know? I was in the darkness, now I'm in the light. And then the being that greeted me told me to follow them. Um, and so we were walking down this hallway. Everything was white. The whole place was white. Um, and then they took me into this room and they pulled out the chair and told me to sit down. And they sat down next to me and they did like a little wave or something like that. With You know, like I said, they didn't have a hand or anything. So they did a little wave. And then the white wall that was across from us turned into a screen. And in that screen, um, he showed me my body on earth. So I guess like in my five-year-old mind, I could comprehend like my body's there, but I'm here. So um, I love how they I give us my visual aids like that. I'm sorry. I love how they give us visual aids like that. How a screen <laughs> can just open up and show you what they want to convey. Yeah. Absolutely. And it was interesting, like, you know, and at first I didn't recognize myself because like I said, like I'm here, you know, but my body's there. My grandmother was holding or my Lola is what they call grandmothers from the Philippines um, was holding me and she had this worried look on her face and I've never seen her, you know, worried like that before. So and she was holding my body and I was like, oh, OK, well, I guess I'm here. I'm there, but I'm here. Like, you know, I turned to the being. I'm like, am I dead? Like, I don't feel dead, <laughs> you know? And then they just laugh, like, in this hearty, like, I, I really can't describe the laugh. It was really, it wasn't to mock me. It was to, like, you know, the you're genuine cute. curiosity. Yeah. yeah. Okay. No, you're cute. Uh-huh. I get yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. And um, he told, or they told me that I was dead. Um, I was like, you know, how did I die? And they said that my body got too hot. And it just, you know, shut down pretty much. So, um, and then they told me it wasn't my time, but um, that I, you know, had to go back because I'm not meant to be there yet. But I, I threw a tantrum because, like, I didn't want to go back to that place. Like, you know, I, I didn't feel the love that I felt there that I was feeling where I was at at that moment. You know what I mean? And I was like, please don't make me go back. And 
they did say it was my choice, but I, it was, it's weird. Like they gave us, they give us a sense of agency to feel like, okay, yeah, <laughs> we, I need to go back. It's not my time, but um, he wasn't demanding or forceful or anything. It was just a very compassionate, um, you know, feeling. He gave me time to, um, cry it out sort of so to speak and um you know he showed me then he showed me my future in the screen you know and he told me that I needed to go back to learn unconditional love you know because there where I was at was freely given it's everywhere it's easy but on this plane it's <laughs> it's a lot harder so yeah. what, he showed me. I'm future, sorry. Go ahead. What did your future look like on the screen? Sure. He um showed me my like my two children, and then I was gonna have a husband. And um, you know, he told me that he knew life would for me would be really really hard because of all the the abuse and everything that I was going to go through. But he said eventually. I will, it'll be worth it because, you know, I will learn love and unconditional love once I have my children and I will learn how to be happy in this plane. So, um, you know, with great reluctance, I was like, okay, fine, you know, I'll go back. But like in your, in your five-year-old mind, you're like showing me the future. Does it, I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't really right. help because you're like, <laughs> you want to say where you're, you feel most comfortable and I, I felt just so comfortable there and um and then he showed me a different screen again and this time it was my body again in the Philippines and there was smoke everywhere and the faith healers were like chanting something and then I saw like they had a um bowl of cold water and then they had the spoon above the cold water with melted wax and um, the, they poured it into the the cold water bowl and it like made a face of some sort. And then the faith healer told my grandmother that that's what um, the being that had possessed me. me. And I, she had to pull it, um, put it under my pillow. And if it broke, then the possession would be, you know, broken. And if it didn't break, then I was gone forever. And um, so they thought it was like some scary looking like very pale death looking woman with black hair and had very ill intent towards me for I don't know why I was five I, I don't know how I could hurt anybody or anything that you know but um so she put it under my pillow and then I remember the being saying okay it's time to go back and then I didn't feel like the pool that I've heard some people felt like when they went back into their body, I just remember like blackness again and then waking up and then all the pain was gone. Like I didn't have pain breathing anymore, no pain in my body. And I was really, really excited to tell my grandmother, but in the Philippines, that's not talked about at all. <laughs> like that's not a topic of discussion. And I was telling her where I was and everything. And she's like, no, 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 you can't, you know, you were possessed, you were taken over and now it's broken and you're okay, you know, so. It's awful, yeah, it's God, was... but you're being told it was the devil. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> so, I mean. I mean, I didn't mean to put words in your mouth. Did it feel like a heaven, like a, a God, like, I don't know your background, but. um, To be honest, I felt to me the being because I've never seen Jesus before, like the Leonardo paintings or any of um, sort of versions of him. Um, so I think that's why they showed me like amorphous form because, you know, I, I'm not to scare me because I, I wouldn't know who that person was. Uh -huh. um, but to me, like I felt it was Jesus because I do relate to him very strongly. I've always, you know, I see him as a, a mentor in my life to guide me you know so <laughs> yeah so when you come back did you try you try to tell people and they just thought this was this demonic thing yeah 
Yeah, they thought it was a possession. So they didn't want to hear what I had to say, go, you know, coming back from the other side or anything. So and I, I was a child, children are not supposed to be heard. You know? So how was things after she, that? Did you feel changed in any way or have experiences? I I did. Um, I remember seeing in traffic once I like, just felt so energetic, like a surge of energy in, in my, you know, person. And um, my mom was getting frustrated in, in the traffic. And in my five year old mind, I'm like, hmm, maybe I can like, magically change it or something. You know? <laughs> and so I took a straw, um, I guess to amplify it or whatever. <laughs> and I'm like, please, please, please let this go by. And then all of a sudden, like all the lights going home were green. That was pretty cool. Excuse me. Sorry. <laughs> and um, after that, we went to the mall and I wanted a toy, you know, kids always wanting toys. Um, and being that I didn't have much, I'm like, oh, this doll is really cool. And um, my mom's like, no, we don't have money. And so I was like, oh, man, I wish we had money. And so when we went up the escalator, there was a wad of cash on, you know, just sitting on the ground. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, now I have enough to buy a toy. <laughs> So that was really cool. Um, and when we were moving from Philippines to Guam, because my dad got us a, um, a housing in Guam for us all to live in, um, the, it was really bad turbulence. Like the plane was going up and down. The lights were going crazy. And I just grabbed the armrest and I'm like, please stop, please stop, please stop. And everything calmed down. It was just, <laughs> it was really cool. So I don't know if that was me or just like coincidence that it just stopped it. <laughs> hey, we have those things we're little and we ask those questions. Is that me? Is that coincidence? Do I have a power? You know, <laughs> And then when we get older, I think, and we look back like now I can ask those questions from an adult brain instead of a child's and like, what happens here? Do I have some gift, <laughs> you know? Like, are we yeah. sitting back like a genie in a bottle? Like we got so many wishes or something. Or are we wasting them? Are we not asking or using it? You know, all these questions. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> and yeah, it's, um, it's um interesting because now that I'm older, I've gone into like, I, to heal um, from all my traumas. Cause you know, the being told me I would have a harsh life. Like, you know, being my dad was in the Navy, he was away a lot for years at a time. And my mother chose friends and boyfriends over myself. And, um, you know, and I was like neglected, emotionally, physically abused. My mom used to hit me a lot growing up. Um, and, you know, when I moved from Guam to Florida, my dad's stepfather sexually abused me. So, um, you know, all of that compounded and, and I got resentful. And um, so pretty much like lashed out and did all these things I shouldn't have done and hurt people I shouldn't have hurt. But, you know, I didn't know how to deal with it. And so through meditation, I like I tried different, you know, churches and different religions and whatnot, and none of them resonated with me. Mm -hmm. And so I told myself, you know what, I'm just going to go with what I feel and believe in my heart. And that's just Jesus is, you know, there he's real. Because um, when I was 13, I had an out of body or I'm sorry, not 13. I keep saying that I was about 14 or 15 um, when my dad bought a house when he finally retired from the Navy after 22 years, um, we were at the house and it was unusually cold for Florida. It was like late thirties, early forties, which is, you know, being a tropical person, <laughs> that's a bit cold. And so I had my personal heater on my nightstand and I was wearing long johns and I had it on full blast. And um, I had an out of body experience where my spirit was taken and um, I was inside of this ca uh, cave like place. It was very dark. And the only light was like the lava underneath the cage that I was in. The cage had like thick bars and whatnot. And they were demonic beings all around. And 
um, one of them got onto the cage and was like, boo, ha, 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 you know what I mean? Like mocking me. And I didn't have a voice. So I was trying to like call out for help. And then I remember the chain getting lowered closer to, you know, the lava on the floor. And with all of my strength, with all of my might, I was like, Jesus, I called on him. <laughs> and everything turned white as day. Like, oh my, it was so bright. And I remember being transported boarded from that scene into the front of my bedroom and I had the door open at that time and um I saw myself sleeping and I was like so dry and dehydrated so I kept telling myself I'm like wake up wake up you know I wasn't waking up and so I finally got you know I was like wake up I yelled at myself and I finally woke up and I felt so dry so I went to the kitchen got water but that was just you know, seeing myself sleeping from <laughs> the other side was was interesting. So, did that make you remember your near death experience? Um. So I've always had that with me. I just I ne I didn't understand what it was because I have never met anyone that had that type of experience as well. So I I didn't talk about it much because I didn't want like my grandmother's you know say oh no 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 you can't talk about that but. You know, so okay. yeah. I was just wondering, you know, if maybe you were, I don't know, you don't want to interject anything, but if maybe you were given that experience to help, even though you always remembered it and you weren't talking about it, maybe bring it forefront in your Prob mind, you know, probably, yeah. I was just wondering because I had experience one time after my second NDE, where I was just looking down my husband and boys, they were asleep on the floor, and I was like, how cute. And this is 1986. And all of a sudden, I was in 1966. Oh, wow. And had a memory of a time that my dad was mean to me. And um, and then a spiritual experience happened after that. And, and when I was little that I, of course, didn't remember, I didn't understand anything what was going on. I just like, I got to get back. You know, I'm in yeah. a 20 year time warp here. And then somebody was knocking at the back door. They said I was knocking on the front. And nobody heard me. The TV was up loud. So I come back and I ran out the door. And when you said that, it made me wonder, like, if your subconscious, you know, created this or were given this, you know, through these beings that uh, help bring it, I don't know, into our subconscious and start asking those questions. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, because you're there by a heater, you were cold, you know, maybe something was so familiar to your NDE to where you had the high fever. Right. And then I, the beans run around, you know, there's just so much similarities there. Right. It could have been. And at that point in my life, you know, being abused and everything, I was in a dark point. I was in a um, thought of negativity. So that's what could have brought, you know, that state of um, experience to, yeah, I, I can see that. And then me calling upon Jesus and then he, cleared everything out you know yeah, like I said he's like, always been there yeah it just seems like <laughs> the message is there you know you're in a dark place look what happens when you call me out you know yeah and sometimes we just don't get it you know we can get these experiences yeah, I know I, as I get older I know you're still young but I look back and I'm like gosh I didn't get it you know I just didn't get <laughs> what that was for <laughs> right but we're indoctrinated to think that these things don't happen here in this plane you know what I mean but it's right. not so black and white there's so many gray areas you know what I mean and the veil is not as thick as a lot of people say it is and who do know? we go talk to when we have these experiences there's nobody like right. if I told you know yeah you tried to look what happened and you have experience like this the out of body like who can you go say this to that is gonna help right. you understand nobody right and I tried talking to a priest about it and you know I told them and they're like oh okay yeah that's cool like that's it you know that's what cool. I mean like <laughs> that's cool like can you help me like work through this you know what I mean right. like I'm trying to find answers here you know so yeah I didn't have anybody to help me navigate with that and then I had another OBE um when I had my tubal ligation, like yours, you know, when you, and um, when I was under anesthesia, I remember they, they put tape over my eyes and then I like came out of my body 
and I was watching the whole thing happen, like the tools that they were using and then the O-ring that they placed on my um, fallopian tube to, um, cause they didn't like cut it or cauterize it or anything like that. They just use that O-ring thing. And I saw the monitor and then I heard what they were having for lunch that day, <laughs> you know? So True, it, Sal, it was really, I think I heard you say. Yeah, Cobb Sal. <laughs> Cobb <Sal. laughs> Yeah. And I was like, okay, you know, and um, after that happened, the six week appointment, the follow up appointment post surgery, um, I was telling my surgeon, yeah, this is what was happening. You guys were using this tool and then the, you know, what you used on my fallopian tube. And she's like, oh my gosh, that's cool. You know, that's crazy. Like <laughs> you were under, you were like under, under. <laughs> she believed you, didn't she? I believe so. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, like yourself, she was Christian. So I, I, I like to think so. I believe so, but I can never speak for, you know, <laughs> right somebody wholeheartedly so I love um, your honesty <laughs> thank you <laughs> I try to you know be as transparent as possible <laughs> I think that's important I can't help but ask this have you ever thought about having a podcast I just see you as a host oh really <laughs> yeah I do Ever since um, we started today with you, I was like, man, I just can see her having a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, my daughters and I are like toying with it. I mean, they're like 12 and 8. Really? So I'm like, I don't know how that's going to work. You know, my oldest is like, yeah, mom, three generations. Like you're millennial. I'm Gen C. And, you know, my youngest is Gen A. And I'm like, eh. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> I mean, like interviewing your death experiencers. Have you thought about that? I mean. I could send you guests if you if you ever I, think you might want to do it. That would be really really cool. I wouldn't know how to do it, but like I could research it. I could help you if you if you're in, if you ever find you're interested. I'd help you get set that up. Was, oh my gosh, I'd love that. Yeah, that would be I'm really, just really like, cool. I see it so clear. I see you doing it, and and you're yeah. so good at it. Uh huh. <laughs> oh, that means that means the world to me. Thank you. I've always been like how do I describe it? Like I've told my husband, like I'm a people's person, but I'm not like, <laughs> love. I like talking to people, but I'm also like, I shield myself because of all my traumas. And stuff. So like, but I've always been good talking to people. So <laughs> I can see that. I think that you would like really listen, like really learn and, um, like a younger version of myself, I think. I think I <laughs> what an honor. Thank you. <laughs> That's awesome. I'm thinking about like doing books and stuff. Just the 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 response I've gotten from doing, you know, interviews and stuff, I I thought I was gonna get like a lot of flack for it, honestly. But I've gotten positive reviews and it's 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 life changing, honestly. Like <laughs> you know so many supportive people like oh yeah she, her you know she seems so genuine she beautiful soul it's like oh my gosh that's amazing like I thought it was gonna be the opposite <laughs> you know what I mean because my husband's it, like remember there's a lot of trolls on the internet so <laughs> yeah if if you do have your own channel and you get a mean comment delete don't <laughs> give it a second thought don't dwell on it don't let it enter you because yeah. You know, we can take that on and, yeah. and it'll be a thousand. Uh, you're wonderful. And that one <laughs> will just right. like, the darkness will come in and, you know, and where we are um, bullied or felt less than everybody else growing up. That one comment can bring back all that trauma. Yeah. And so just a little thing, if you do it, if you get delete it as fast as possible, don't let yourself remember it. Think about it. <laughs> right. Go let it out <laughs> yeah yeah like um that that one person that did that to me when my grandmother passed away um at 13 years old that was very traumatic experience um when she passed but he told me to like sit next to him and I'm like no that's okay and he's like that's okay I've already had the best of you so to hear that at 13 you know what I mean like your stepfather no, but my step grandfather. 
yeah, my dad's stepdad. When uh, yeah, the one that molested you. Yeah, he said that when to he you? said he when he said that to me after my grandmother passed away because uh, I wouldn't sit next to the couch with him because I wanted to guard myself from oh. all that, and I didn't realize until last year how much that phrase had affected me and my self worth and self confidence and everything like that. But after having healed from that, it's like, wow, felt liberated. I know my worth. You know what I mean? I may not be perfect, but I know my best has not got bit, been gotten. You know what I mean? He so gloated. Like, yeah. He gloated when you're grieving your grandmother, his wife. Yeah. Gloated abusing you. That's, that's evil. Yeah. yeah. And then um, I didn't, tell like and tell anybody until like he did the same thing to my cousin and that you know she s said something about it and that's when we like went to the whole trial and the court thing and everything and then when I told my grand my mother she actually blamed me <laughs> for the situation like it's what did common. you do to make it happen and common stuff. isn't like, it to do yeah that. I used to work at children's <laughs> services and I saw that so much. I thought if I had a daughter and she ever said the slightest thing, I would totally, you know, like throw the husband out, go to the police, yeah. you know, because, yeah. Well, my grandmother had the same experience um, with a family member growing up with herself. So when I tried telling her, she said, oh, we don't talk about things like that. We don't talk about it. So, <laughs> Yeah. Which is why so much of it happens. They know the girls won't talk. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm like, I'm so, I think I'm, I'm lessening, but I think that's why I became like a hover mom. <laughs> you know? Like I became overprotective and, oh, what's going on here? Yeah. It's me too. It's that fear. <laughs> you know what I mean? That fear. <laughs> like you don't want your children to go through something what you went through. So. But sorry, I digress. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, no, you're fine. You're fine. I get yeah. it. Because, you know, um, when we talk about our near-death experiences, it's just not the near-death experience. It's our whole being that comes into play. Yeah. Because we're remembering these deep things in our soul from our NDE and the other deep things in our soul are in that same space, I think. And that just seems like it just seems natural to opened up those doors as well because it all seems to fit together somehow I think so I think like what I because I like I said I, I view Jesus as a mentor and the course of miracles and everything like I've always like viewed him as th my role model you know what I mean um I used to actually have a I love Jesus tattoo on my chest <laughs> you got rid of it I had it covered up because a lot of people were mocking it saying, Oh, is Jesus your boyfriend? Oh, who's Jesus? You know what I mean? Yeah. So <laughs> I had it covered up with my daughter, my oldest daughter's name. So, <laughs> oh. <laughs> but you know, and um, I try to treat people the best way I want to be treated. Um, but sometimes trauma <laughs> gets the best of you and you'll always like, revert back to you know shielding yourself yeah um, I get it it's so yeah. strange listen to your story because yeah like I said before we got started so similarity so many similarities to my own which I told you but um what I didn't tell you is because I know you haven't heard my story which I'm not going to tell here but mm -hmm. um my five-year-old drowning when it was over and I was walking back up to the house and um, an angel that had talked to me as I was hovering over the pond, she now appeared. And I was going to turn around from walking over the house and go back to the pond. And because my family, I realized during my NDE, my family didn't love me. And so I thought, I'm going to go back to where I was in the water. And I'm not going to, drowning her, so I'm not going to fight it this time. Because I want to go back to, you know, running around like I was, flying around and doing stuff, looking for kids to play with. <clears throat> and uh, angel said, when she appears, she says, no, don't. I said, why? You know, they don't love me. And she says, you'll have a lot of love someday when you have your own family. And so when you talked about yours, how they showed you your future with your husband and kids, it really touched my heart. Yeah. 
sorry. <laughs> I told myself I wasn't gonna cry today. <laughs> but and um, yeah, during my ectopic pregnancy, um, I was begging to go back for raising my kids. So it's only twenty five, and I said if um, and I was told it was my time. The answer was no, and which is like most people say, you know, they're told to go back, and which I never heard of NDE back then, eighty six, and so. Um, and just your story's just touching back on mine so much in my heart. And so, cause I wanted to let you know that, um, so I said, well, if you can show me my kids would be better off without me for every reason, I agree to stay. But if not, I beg to return. And then I saw Jesus from behind and he took me down in the future and showed my kids in the near future, how upset they were. And so, you know, you were showing your husband and kids in the future. And I understand what you're talking about to be shown something in the future, and to come back from that, like, how do I wrap my mind around <laughs> that I was in the future? And then after that NDE, when I he heard that, subconsciously heard that knock on the door, but instead I was back 20 years, you know, 1966 with, um, you know, trying to wrap my mind around that. Like, how was I back there? I mean, I guess it's like what you hear about the soldiers and have PTSD. They have these visions and they're right back there. But um, why is this happening? Because after my second NDE, I kept having flashbacks from when I was abused as a kid. Um, and it just seems like, like I said, like that place in your soul where our NDE lives, it seems like all of our pain is there too. Mm -hmm. and, and it just seems natural to one bliss you know in the ear confusing in the ear scary in the ear, whatever it was it's like it lives there where all that pain does if that makes any sense I don't know absolutely no I agree like maybe because we live in this plane the duality of it all you know you can't have joy without sadness and all that so the NDE probably reminds us that there is something better out there than here but right now we just gotta <laughs> walk ourselves home to that place but we got to endure what's here you know because this is from all the texts that I've read regarding um you know uh, past life regressions of other people like uh Dolores Cannon I'm not sure if you've heard of Dolores okay. Cannon um you know people saying that earth is a school and this is one of the hardest schools <laughs> you know and I I believe that because it is hard to be here it's so heavy and and dense and, and you know there there was no pain like everything was you were engulfed in this undescribable love you know what I mean it was like a blanket over you you're safe you're home you're loved here it's like fight or flight constantly <laughs> yeah and everybody's telling you don't talk about the pain yeah. Don't bring that up. We don't talk about it. We sweep this under the rug. Nobody wants to hear this. And don't be negative. Think positive. Right. Leave it in the past. <laughs> Forgive. And I was like, what do you do with this baggage? It's right. still there. You know, I had an aha moment just a couple minutes ago. I have been asking myself more lately about why did I think that because it sounds so silly and so embarrassed when I tell the part of my NDE on the second NDE at 25 we're headed to the hospital have the eptopic and my pain suddenly faded in such a strange way I remember instinctively and deeply thinking wherever my pain just went that's where I'm going and as we're talking about this like a hall moment it's like wait a minute maybe there is some truth to that Maybe all of our pain goes to, you want to call it heaven, the other side, someplace. And, but my soul was going there. It's like, I felt it trailing behind it. Like all the pain, my physical pain of the epitopic. Yeah. When it faded, it faded in such a profound way that I, right, when it faded, like I stepped over into this mental clarity. Wherever it went, that's where I'm headed. That's how I knew I was about to die. And, you know, which doctors even say, you know, people get these feelings they're about to die, like foreboding or um, before right. they do. And maybe maybe there's something to that, to where the, our, our physical body starts to slip before our soul does. 
you know, like even resuscitation, they bring people back, you know, they're gone physically. Where are they? Where's their soul, right? The scientists ask, because we bring them back and now they're back. Where were they? Well, we know right. where they were, right? Yeah. <laughs> this yeah. seems like the, like they we're still hanging around like you were. You were outside and you, that's so, um, you're the first one I've heard to where you were like physically acting out your near death experience because you were playing with kids and your mom and grandma saw you physically. Right. Like thought, where's she doing? Trying to catch, was it lightning bugs? Like just bugs. It was yeah, like bugs. daylight outside okay. or something. <laughs> yeah. okay. Because that's the first time I've ever heard anybody. And I think that's pretty miraculous. You were acting out and your body was acting out what you were doing in heaven. Yeah. It was, it was pretty cool. Like, even though it was, you know, bright outside, you could still see the golden aura around these children. And it was brighter than outside, <laughs> if that's all, you know, it was really, really cool. Like, yeah. Um, sorry. <laughs> and I'm then, sorry if I got like, you off track. No, 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 you're good. I appreciate you. I enjoy listening to you. <laughs> um, but I mean, like nowadays I have experiences as well. Like I think because of my NDE, um, I don't know if this is the same with you. Um, I can feel beings and sometimes if they want me to, I can see them in my mind's eye. Um, and you know, electronics, I have to be careful with electronics <laughs> um, sometimes because they'll go crazy. <laughs> so, and, um, you know, I know one time when my cousin was telling me about um, the last time she saw her grandfather before he passed, like when she was telling me this story, I was sitting across from her on the couch and like he came through so clearly in my mind's eye, like, you know, he had a huge smile on his face and, like he was so bright and just the like the amount of love he had for them came through and I started crying. I was so overwhelmed by it. Do you remember so, when like, that started? Um, when I was younger, um, I would see shadows. Like shadows walk by, like I'm, you know, brushing my teeth in the bathroom and there would be a shadow that would cross a doorway. Um and then I just feel like it got stronger and stronger. Um, I know when my great aunt, like when my grandmother passed away, I felt it in my body, like a piece of me had left. And um, it started raining and there was like a rainbow in the sky after it had rained and I knew she was gone. Um, when my cousin passed away at 15, I knew before even the adults told us what had happened, I knew. Um, so like... Sometimes I just know things like when my um, abuser killed himself and my father called me on the phone when I was visiting my uh, my mom before the trial for the summer. Um, he told me he was gone and I'm like, yeah, he shot himself, didn't he? And he's like, yeah, how'd you know? <laughs> like, I, you're gone. Like, you know, I just know things. Um, and re most recently when I saw a medium, like they told me I was a very strong light being, <laughs> whatever that means. So, <laughs> yeah, that with I your just, grandpa, did they try to put the blame on you and your cousin for coming from No, there? good. No, um, it was the state versus him. So, because we were still minors at that time. Um, so, you know, they were they told my dad to take me to therapy to help me process everything that never happened. So like, I didn't have help processing everything that I internalized in my childhood. So, but, you know, delving into like even churches and Christianity, um, no offense to anybody, um, didn't help me. It wasn't until like, I found. They don't do they? They don't. I found spirituality and I'm like, I'm just going to believe what I feel resonates with me. And that's Jesus. I know he's real because I have seen him. I have felt him. Um, and, you know, I like the Buddhist teachings. So just different, you know, different types of religion. I don't believe in one type of religion. I believe in 
spirituality. Cause I think spirituality, I love the sayings like spirituality is when you have gone through hell and then come back and your soul's like, okay, <laughs> you know, I know there's something else out there. You know what I mean? So I don't go to church. Uh, then I say, uh, cause I am church. Cause that's the way yeah. I feel. Uh, it might sound really arrogant, but that's the way I feel. Like, I don't need that building. I don't need those people. There was nothing yeah. there. I tried a bunch for a long time and nothing <laughs> did it except for the work I did inside. And right. so for, you know, for me, it's praying to God and just, you know, like doing this podcast. And, yeah. Um, and I respect you for that. <laughs> thank you. Because the community is nice, but like from my experience, from my personal experience, I don't want to say this about anybody else's experience or trump anybody else's experience but from my experience there were a lot more like cattiness and backstabbing and right. you know gossiping and like oh yeah donate to this church and let me have my bmw type of thing you know so it's like i don't want to associate myself with that type of environment you know <laughs> right Sometimes we're um, just too smart spiritually <laughs> to dumb ourselves down to nothing against religions. I admire people that could go to church and have a wonderful time and feel right. the community and feel the love. God bless you. Cause it's just, right. you know, and I really, I'm really happy for the people and I hope churches continue to flourish and do well. You know, I don't want churches to go, you know, religion to go out of business or, out of style but yeah there's some of us it's just our inner work our inner world is our church and yeah. i believe that neither rock nor stone can stop you from calling on me <laughs> so, yeah i believe that <laughs> and it's just you know i'm i don't feel like i don't want people thinking that my journey is better than others because we're not, we're all on a different path. We just all have different experiences and we're all varying in our spiritual path. Some may never find, you know, you know, their way into spirituality or wanting to heal and others really want to heal to where they just want to be better for themselves. I'm not judging. There's no right. judgment and, here. <laughs> right. And some of us are introverts, you know, yeah. Or introverts. And it, to go around public, like I can do this all day, talking to people online, because <laughs> I'm alone here in this room. But right. you know, I'm safe. But like in public, I would be a totally different person, very guarded. So, you know, to yeah. put me in a, a room, you know, like a church and all these people and all these personalities, and I'm picking up everybody's emotions. And because when it's you go on the other side <laughs> and you experience that telepathic communication, I think we, gain this um extra instinct we have we come back of just picking up thoughts and and it's just overwhelming yeah. and sometimes it's like i don't think they like me and i don't think they think i should be here and, and I, <laughs> i'm just really and i'm picking up all this stuff and then yeah <laughs> i'd rather be alone and focused <laughs> me too like i've recently learned how to shield um, myself from all the energy because sometimes it can get really overwhelming like you know I would take days at a time to recuperate from everything because feeling other people's emotions that's like so draining as a person like <laughs> you just want to shield yourself so it's like oh your feelings are your feelings I'm gonna keep my feelings to my feelings <laughs> you know <laughs> we do we take it on and carry it around and um, I remember my mom was in the hospital years back and I hadn't talked to her a couple of years. She was really nasty and mean to me and wanted me to stay away. And all of a sudden I had this, I won't go into this moment. Like I knew I had to go see her. Then I went there and looked down at her leg and I was like, why is one leg bigger than the other? And her nurse happened to be there. She had home health coming and she's like, I didn't check her today. What do you see? And I said, well, look, this leg looks a little bit bigger than the other. She's taking her to the emergency room. Might be a blood clot. So long story short, she was in the hospital for a while. And um, I was trying to find out what's wrong with her because she was walking and going to the bathroom herself and everything. As soon as she went in the hospital, 
suddenly she's had me put her on a bedpan. She's had me wipe her. She's had me get her food. I'm feeding her. And I'm just like focused on her face, watching everything, trying to figure out, figure her out what's going on. How can I help? And, and I tell the nurses, I was like, is she dying? I said, what are you talking about? And I said, well, she was walking and going to the bathroom herself and beating herself. Now she's like this. And so my, I said, told her, I said, my husband's coming to take me to dinner because I've been there a few days and she acted irritated about that. So he come, took me to dinner. I left and when I come back. Now, mind you, she was in this bed with these alarms in case she started to fall out or something. Right. She climbed over this thing with the alarm so it wouldn't go off. And she's running to the bathroom in her room. She don't see me because I'm watching her from behind. She goes to the bathroom, plops down. I hear her in there using it. Hear her wipe, hear her flush. And she jumps out, starts to run out. She sees me. And I said, oh, oh, I need help. It was manipulation. You know, oh my god! But I didn't know that yet. So I went to dinner with my husband before I found out it was manipulation. Um, I where I've been so consumed of watching her every you know face, like what's wrong? Trying to figure this out. Um, we went to Taco Bell, and as I'm eating and drinking, I feel her mouth instead of mine, like how she moves her mouth and everything. And I felt like I got to get her off me. Like I am so I have consumed her so much. Yeah, she I attached even, herself to you. Yeah, like I can't even feel me. I need to bring me back. I need some time away here to right. step back. And then I went back and I saw that. I went home. And I come oh, wow. back the next day. And I said, you you pulled a trick on me, you know. So then she tried something else. It was totally bizarre. What you know, But just carrying on, saying this weird stuff to the nurse about me and all this. She tried some other manipulation. But, but I'm yeah, sorry. Like, but we we can just like take on emotions and stuff, but it can be really extreme if we're really caretaking for yeah. somebody. Just get lost, and I can see people, you know, taking care of somebody with dementia or cancer or something, and then eventually they die, and how they probably have trouble getting back to who they were because everything is about them, right? Constantly. Yeah, I'm I mean, sorry. I can see that. you. Oh, thank you. But I can see you that way. You know, where I can see you just like delve into other people, and then we have to go back and delve back into ourselves. And yeah, yeah. For the longest time, I thought pleasing others would be better for me to silence my voice. You know what I mean? As long as they're happy, I I don't deserve to be happy. You know what I mean? And so I, I can definitely you know, feel, get lost in other people's, like you did. So it's, yeah. <laughs> I'm recently now just finding, like, myself and self-love and self-care and, like, healing to me has been really important for the last year because I was in a, a really bad mental state. I was taking medications for anxiety, depression. I was um, numbing it with alcohol and cannabis and everything, just anything to numb my pain because it was surfacing mm -hmm. and I couldn't push it down any longer. And I'm almost a year and a half sober <laughs> out of hey. everything. So thank you. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot to, when you don't take care of yourself, like you said, you can get lost and then it takes you back to like, who, who am I? You know, where am I? And like, but once you find yourself, it's the universe. I feel like the universe or it's God, whatever you want to call him, gets on your behind you. It's like, yes, finally, you know, you know, <laughs> you need to do what you came here to do. And in, in my head, like I've always felt like I was a healer. Um, cause my grandfather, my Lolo in my mom's side, he was a faith healer, but they believed that because he was my grandpa, he couldn't work on me during my pos possession. <laughs> I say quotation mark. So that's why they had to call somebody else. So now I'm like finally finding Reiki and getting certified in Reiki and everything. And it's a lot of doors have opened for me because of that. You know, it's amazing when you yeah. heal and 
you get away from toxicity, toxic people, and you're like, no, I, I'm not gonna, you know, put up with that anymore. <laughs> I'm gonna. It is Reiki. I hear that a lot, and I've never really looked at what are, are is the thing. Sure. Reiki is um, energy healing, pretty much. Um, it uses symbols um, that Master Isui, <laughs> sorry if I butchered the name. Um, he was a Japanese monk who uh, meditated in the mountains. And after his meditation came up with these like symbols to help heal people. And um, so it's just a different, just a different form of um, energy healing. So um, that's what I'm symbol? doing work there's um right now i'm only reiki one certified so i have the chikure symbol and then the hearth symbol that's what i've is been um attuned with i'm sorry is it chakra are you saying chakra? no um it's not chakra it's just like um different healing symbols okay. sorry <laughs> i'm sorry i'm clueless i um, just was curious yeah because i hear a lot then, of people into that and i'm like i don't really know what that is yeah, it's it's just another form of because there's energy healers, there's um, Reiki, there's like um, Archangel healing. So it's it's just a different form of energy healing. And um, a lot when I practice on people, they say like I'm a natural at it. So I feel like I'm going I'm at the path where I need to go. I bet you <laughs> so. are. I can see that. Thank you. Some people I know that say they're in it. are Well, I think this one guy in particular. And he He's a friend of mine, but he was just a really cold person, like very, he's young and cold and blunt. And I'm like, you, an energy healer? I mean, I would, I'm just thinking, wouldn't you need some kind of empathy or compassion, something <laughs> to bring forward? I mean, because I'm just feeling ice cubes here from you, but I don't know. <laughs> so yeah, I can see all... you be, you would be I'm good sorry? I can see where you would be good at that. Oh, thank you. It's all plays in intuition. And I feel like with, um, med like, I've been meditating for close to three years now. And I feel like that has increased my med um, my intuition greatly. So it's intuition based, like, where do they need the healing, the body will tell me through energy or blocked energy in the body and stuff. So now, how does this compare to um, prayer? The meditation, like meditation versus prayer is like either or is this just something different than prayer? I think it's it's one and the same. It's all about intention based um, with meditation. It's like the goal is to let your thoughts come and go and observe them without reacting to them and just clearing your mind of everything that's in your mind because our minds are always going 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 you know and to just quiet your mind and be still and focus on things that are not around you that you can see um and then prayer it's like you're praying to god um whoever you want to pray to it's the same thing but i feel as long as you have the intention, you can meditate or prayer. <laughs> I think it'll equally be as good for you. So it's all intention based. Yeah. Last week, a guy contacted me, wanted me to, well, he was offered to a lot of people and I volunteered. Um, I think it'll be on his YouTube next week, but he's a hypnotist and he wanted to hypnotize oh. people, help them get back into their near death experience. And I don't meditate. But as he was getting me back lower and calmer, I'm thinking, I bet this is what they're trying to achieve with meditation. Yeah. But yet it had a, an intention of, I didn't know what the intention was. I never watched him, uh, uh, yeah, um, hypnotist do this before, hypnosis, whatever. So I didn't want to expect. I assumed, what, I think he said to help people get into their NDE in a deeper level. I assumed that it was he was going to be like okay you're there now what do you see like I would bring out more details about Wendy I hadn't seen before so was, that's what I was kind of hoping that I would like see something or remember something or but he didn't do that that's not what the intention was I didn't know that it was just <gasps> to be there in that space and in that yeah. space I was at my 25 year old Indy and I was just in front of, I was in a bright white light and I, and there was these beings there, which I always knew that, but I was just focusing on those beings 
and how I felt them watching me. And that, but I went deeper into it. And this is all it was, which is that one part there. I went deeper into it because I just stayed in that space for a moment, feeling them watching me and how I felt in that moment. That's and awesome. I, I felt their wisdom, their patience, kindness, understanding, and that, and their, you know, knowing of the future, knowing how this is all going to play out. That I just felt their knowledge and not that I knew their minds. I didn't know what they were thinking. I just, you know, when you feel somebody looking at you and then you turn and look in the store and like, you just catch eyes for a second. It's kind of that, right. like somebody's watching me, like, who are they? And just had that gaze, which we normally don't gaze in the store very long. Like we see somebody right. looking at <laughs> Well, we don't stand there. It and just, often. Yeah. We should though, right? <laughs> like if we're somebody's doing that, we should just like, okay, we're connected for some reason. Let's see what this connection is. Wouldn't that be weird? <laughs> like hold hands, like, okay, what is this connection we're feeling? Did we live in a past life together? <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> like, do we have a mutual dead relative or something? I don't know. <laughs> the most I ever weird. felt that feeling, I was at a high school reunion and this girl was there and I felt so drawn to her. And I just went up to her. I was like, I feel like I know you. And she said, I don't remember you. And I was like, I know you from somewhere. And I was like, she, they, her and her husband's getting ready to go somewhere. And I said, can me and my husband go where you guys are going? Like, I just wanted to be with it. her. She's like, okay. You know, it was just going to a different um, hotel bar across the street. And I don't know what it was about her. And I, and later, years later, um, and I cannot swear that was the same woman, but I think it was years later, I kept thinking, was that that lady? Because I knew this lady was a nurse and she was married to a cop. And years later, there was a heard on the news a cop killed his wife and buried her on the, this road that my brother happens to live on and it was never found out what happened to her until a psychic called the police and said go to Nats road and she I lives just got in everywhere yeah we live in <laughs> southeast ohio she lives in pennsylvania Nats road like who knows Nats road i even know Nats road and i drive right. by there every day and she's going to Nats Road. So the cops like, well, okay, what do we got to lose? We jumped in and guess what? We'd had a lot of rain and he went to, that cop went to check on the grave, make sure that it didn't uncover her. They caught him there at the grave. And oh so of course he went to prison. And so I just, you know, was really into this story, you know, as everybody was at the time. Well, years later when I had adopted kids and we were going to Catholic church, my kids got to be friends with this these kids that the cop dad killed the mom and we got to, and they were got right. They went in our, we had a big 15 passenger white van and these, I picked these kids up where we were going. We took them with us and just, they're all friends. And mm -hmm. uh, they got talking about their mom and they said, her name's Jennifer. And I'm like, was it that woman? I just had, and I can't swear that it was because I don't know. Cause I don't remember that. What she told me her name was. I don't remember what she looked like, but I was like, is that how I was drawn to her? Like it would be something in the future, not right. in the past. Right. And, and it was so weird too, because I look back later and I thought, okay, before we got to be friends with those boys, the girls kept seeing this, like there's like a spirit just pop in and out. Like, whoa, there she is again, a door had opened. And I just started calling it Jenny. There's Jenny, there's Jenny, and I don't know why I come up with the name Jenny. That's I would say crazy. Jennifer sometimes, would say Jenny. And then later they said her mom was Jennifer. I'm like, wait a minute. I feel That's like, awesome. you know, I'm really taking her sons under my wings. And right. we really got close with those boys. And uh, my youngest adopted son, they're to this day, they're best of friends. They're like brothers. That's awesome. But I don't know. You know, we just get those connections sometimes and it might not be something from the past. Like people think, oh, past lives. I don't know if I believe right. that. But it ended up, I think it was something that in the future that was going to happen. Like I walked in this, my husband says, let's go see this, these people's brand new log cabin they just built. Friends of his. 
And they're like, oh, right. okay. I didn't know them, but they were friends of his from childhood. So it seemed a brand new cabin, never been lived in, didn't even have their furniture moved in. And we're like, oh, this is so cool. And I started to walk up on the porch. And before I did, I was like, whoa, wait a minute. And this is before I was paying attention to the feelings that, you know, I do right. now. And um, like, wait, wait a minute. Something's happening. To he, something's happening to me. And I'm like, I'm afraid to go in there. And he's like, what? I, I can't explain it. I, I, it's like somebody died in there. And they said, right. no, it's brand new. <laughs> like they're grinning at me. They're real nice. And I'm like, before they opened the door, I said, I can tell you exactly what this house looks like inside. And they're like, what? And I like, as soon as you walk in on the left, there's stairs that go up and there's two bedrooms up there. And there's the, as soon as you walk in, it's living room, there's kitchen towards the back. And, it's, and they're like, yeah, like I have been in here and there's no way I've been in here. And years later, I heard that their brother, the guy that built a cabin, committed suicide. And he used to be best friends with my ex-husband. And it was years later, even after that, that I got wondering, because I didn't know where he committed suicide. It was in that house. It was in that cabin. That's amazing. And like, you know, when I got older, I'm like, wait a minute. I remember having that feeling, telling everybody I had to see and describe the house. Somebody died in this house. And right. it was decades later before somebody actually did commit suicide in the house. And it was, you know, a long time later before I realized to, to you know, before I put it together. It's because I didn't know, you know, for a long time that, that that's where he did it at. I assumed it was at some where he lived. And right. somebody mentioned in passing one time it was it was at that cabin, like at that cabin. Somebody killed himself. <laughs> like it was in the future. Right. So. Speaking of the future, what's funny, Peggy, is a few days ago, I had this very, very vivid dream before you even contacted me that I was contacted to be on another podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and then when I saw your message, I showed it to my oldest daughter. I'm like, oh, my gosh, my dream came true. <laughs> It was really, really cool. I have dreams like that sometimes, like, you know, where you get to see things. And dreams to me, if you remember them, they're they're not dreams, they're messages. Right. If you don't remember them, then they're just regular, you know, everyday dreams. But sometimes I remember my dreams so vividly. And it's like, okay, what is this trying to tell me? But to, like, dream about, oh, yeah, I'm going to get invited to a podcast. And a few days later, you message me. It's like... <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> yeah, I can have the most, I don't remember, I don't take the time to stop remembering my dreams usually, but if I do, or if one's just really, you know, bizarre and I wake up and if I tell my husband about this crazy dream, as I start to tell it, like light bulb starts to come on. Oh, wait, I know why I dreamt this. I can figure <laughs> this out. And um, you said something about your NDE, you was like this animation, like suspended animation in the black void yeah like like I know my body I could I could breathe without pain and my body wasn't hurting but like I didn't know if I could move at all because you know you're like in this vast darkness <laughs> like what is happening <laughs> you know yeah. and it just put me in mind of almost like you know a, a dream state and I think our NDEs are so close to that but yet th we don't have to um pick apart the meaning like a dream Right. It's, it's, it's way too obvious. It, you know, the, the dumb stuff's taken out. Like I, right. the first, one of the, one of the first guys I interviewed died of COVID and uh, he's a very believable person because he was, used to be head of the police academy here in Ohio. Oh, wow. Yeah. And <laughs> he was a homicide detective and he wasn't a believer of, you know, God or anything. He says they went to church like Easter or Christmas because his wife was Catholic or something, but that, you know, he went not to bother <laughs> me that he had COVID. And the first part of the COVID was like dancing panda bears and stuff. It was, you know, like dreams. But then later he had the NDE where he was in like the golden gates. He was in the city and he was, uh, I think going up steps and they'd say, Oh no, this is you know, like, it's not for you you don't belong here. And, um, and that went a few times before he was there. And 
I was just sitting there help and I was new at doing podcasts. So, you know, I have learned, but I don't always go by what I learn. Like I would really, <laughs> I really should just sit and keep my mouth shut. And let people tell their story. Right. Cause that's what the audience no, wants. You're, but, you're good. It's a good you know, interaction. <laughs> so. but I couldn't help. I was new and I hadn't learned like I should do that yet. And I was just like, so happy to talk to another end of ear cause COVID and you can't see anybody. And, right. um, so he's such a nice guy. And uh, so I told him later, I says, you know, I wonder if his, his, his religion was like the building. Like, right. and that's what his NDE started out. Like it was just the building. Like it's just the city. Like, this is all you get. You can see it, but you can't come in because he would go to church, you know, Easter and Christmas. Like that's, it was the extent of his religion. And like it was just seeing making these parables like and um comparing things and he's like, Yeah, I think you're right. And his wife would come on camera and, and listen and put her little sense and he's like, Yeah, yeah. And but he's a believer now because he he That's had awesome. confirmations and things like he he ended up seeing this guy on his in his NDE on the front porch and he was making red, white, and blue flags. And he said, the guy turned to Randy, Randy who this guy was, he said, Tell Madison her grandpa's okay. And so once he's home and he's recovering from COVID, he tells his daughter, he says, uh, get me an appointment, uh, for, get a haircut. Says there's a um, card in a drawer in there somewhere and uh, to call. So she gets the card. She says, dad, did you see this? He's like, what are you talking about? Just call and make the appointment. She says, dad, there's a name written on the back of this, Madison. He said, get me an appointment with Madison. So when oh my gosh. <laughs> haircut, he tells her about his NDE and about this guy on the porch making red, white, and blue flags. And it says, tell your, um, tell my granddaughter Madison at the salon. That's what the guy said at the salon that her grandpa's okay. And he says, Hey, don't you, he don't use the word salon. He used, you know, hair, right. whatever he calls it. Well, guys call it. And uh, <laughs> there you go. Barbershop. And so he tells Madison and she's, she's got her mask on because of COVID. She looks at him and she said, you are the second near-death experiencer to come back with a message from him. Oh, and so she cool. had just moved there from some other state. Her husband's a doctor. And um, so it was just amazing that she would even be there and you know, have contact with Randy. But heaven knows, right? Heaven knows what, what we can do. And he, they knew like that card was in the drawer with Madison. This all work out. And they said, because there was a guy that had was killed on a motorcycle accident, had an NDE come back and contact. I forget how the story was that he was able to, I know how it was. He didn't contact hit the, this guy in heaven that's making the flags. His wife was looking for, see if he has any life insurance after he died right. and the guy in heaven. And, uh, she found a number and it was the wrong, it wasn't insurance. Like she thought it was, it was somebody else. And they said, Oh, uh, I'm, no, I'm sorry. It wasn't you. I thought this insurance company. And I, I just explained the story. And the guy said, well, are you and named whatever name was, he said, cause I was told my NDE to give you the message that he's okay. So the wife had already got the message. Now Madison is hearing that, you know, he's right. giving a message to Randy. And I guess this guy was known, like he won awards. He had been in the war, Vietnam War, I think. And um, he would sit and make these um, red, white, and blue flags for um, veterans that have passed on, like didn't have something on the grave or I don't know. There's some story behind it that he was known for and got some kind of award for being his hero or, or helping veterans or something. And so the whole, I uh, just, I like, Randy, this has got to be a movie. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> and, you know, a lot of people just want to, you know, they, the audience, they want to hear the NDE and be entertained and then go to the next right. one and be entertained. And I don't think that they stop and realize what we're talking about. It's way deeper. There's, we can pick these apart and pick like this puzzle and, and find out. And like, there's these gems, right. there's these bits of light that is inside of the NDE that we're not taking the time to explore. Like, you know, how we could go in the future 
And then we come back, like, we can't talk to anybody about that. But if when we do, it's like it opens up a whole new world of possibilities in our daily lives of, like I say, having this connection to somebody and thinking, how do I know you? Well, you don't yet. And you may never, right. like this woman, she, I would never meet her, but I would meet her kids and and just feel this motherly instinct to put take them under my wing. And it's like, yeah. it makes, makes life really mysterious. It really does. And I think people are put in our paths, you know, for a long time, a little time, but for a reason. And everybody is a teacher to us. Like if we just, instead of, I guess I've gotten out of that victimhood is like, why is this happening to me? Instead, I look at things as like, what is this trying to teach me? You know, and I think that's been helpful <laughs> in my journey as well. So like, I think people are put in our path to teach us, okay, are we going the right way? Are we reverting back to where we were? Okay, what is this trying to teach me? Why is this making me angry? What does that say about me? Why is this person doing this thing, like making me feel this way? You know what I mean? Like, I think everything is a teacher and in the school of life <laughs> where that phrase comes from. <laughs> and, and people that say, oh, you just need to forgive. What I hear is you just need to forget. You just need to <laughs> shut up. Nobody has time to listen to you. Now let's talk about this BMW I want, like you said, BMW <laughs> or, you know, this materialistic stuff. I was like, I cannot focus right. on that. Yeah, I'm not I like, like, yeah. None of that matters to me. Like, and I've forgiven those that have hurt me, not for them, because they won't come back to me and say, oh, I'm sorry I did this to you. I'm sorry, this, this, and that. They're not going to do that because they're too stuck in their head that, oh, you hate me because I did this to you, so I'm the victim. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> so I've forgiven them for me. And once I've forgiven that person that hurt me the most is like, you can't have this hold over me anymore. I'm taking back control, not control, but like I'm taking back who I am, my worth of my life. Like you don't get to, you know, live in my head anymore and put me down for everything that I've done. You know, um, in my life, I've gone from jobs to jobs to jobs to jobs, searching for that perfect thing, which doesn't exist. <laughs> And every time something got hard, I pulled back. And that's yeah. how I lived my life because, you know, in my 13, yeah, in my 13 year old mind, like my worth has been taken. But now that I've forgiven that person, it's like I've gotten my worth back, you know? So like, and that's like, I've forgiven them for me, but I'm not forgetting, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like we so. have the forgiveness to give, but until they ask for it, we can't right. give it. And they're never right. going to ask for it because, you know, they hate us, because, like you said, because they're the victim because we, you know, have this hurt that they did to us. And I don't think they realize, I want to forgive you. I really need to forgive you. I really need you to ask for it because it's there right. to give if they just ask. Yeah. But unfortunately, sometimes they won't <laughs> get to ask. <laughs> no, most you do know. not want to ask. They'll just. No, I think it's pride or, you know, accountability. They don't want to be accountable and be held accountable or responsible for what they've done. So they just try to suppress it, ignore it or blame the victim for it. Like when my mom blamed me for being abused by this person when I was a child myself, like what, what, what did you do? Like, I didn't do anything. <laughs> I was a child, you know what I mean? So like, instead of, I think that was her deflecting, oh, I wasn't there for you. And so instead of blaming myself and holding myself accountable, I'm going to blame you kind of and, and mentality. It's a painful feeling if you've ever done anything you know, that you were, you know, you had to apologize to somebody for, it hurts really bad. You know? Yeah. I know my son said, um, and I had forgotten about it. He said that when he was little, um, I, there was, I made banana bread in one pan and meatloaf in another pan and they looked the same. <laughs> and I said, Jeremy, put ketchup on the meatloaf for me. He put it on the banana bread. 
Oh no. <laughs> and I called him a retard. Oh. And I he told me that I started crying. I was like, I'm so sorry, Jeremy. I was mad at your dad. I remember uh, my mind went right back. His dad had done something and I took it out on him. Right. I told him kind of a retard seem to his room. I just bawled and bawled. And every time I think about it, I tear up. And it's like 10 years ago. He was laughing about it. And I'm like, he's <gasps> like, mom, it's okay. I'm like, no. And so my other sons come in. It's like, what's going on? I said, I got Jeremy. And they thought, like, and then they're like, no. And he was like, 10. And, I, and they just kind of laugh. You know, because they called each other names all the oh. time. Like, let's make it. And I'm like, I still tear up when I think about like, right. oh, my sweet baby retard. <laughs> they look just the same. Like, anybody would make the same mistake. But yeah, but it hurts. It hurts right. to admit that you hurt somebody, that you did yeah. something wrong. And so I imagine it is hard for him to ask. I And, you know, what I have to say about, like, my parents, what I've learned from them in my, you know, my upbringing is what not to do, how not to parent. And I do thank them for that. And I appreciate that lesson because... I feel like I'm a better parent because of it as well. Like, and you know, when I do something wrong, cause we do sl slip up. Parenting is super hard. <laughs> 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 and um, you can read all the books, but it's still like at that moment in time, like different scenarios, different situations. Uh, so like when I do something wrong, I think about it, I reflect, and then I explain to my child, okay, this is what I was feeling at that point. I'm sorry for this, this, and that. And, you know, I'll try to be more mindful, you know, and, I, um, and then I apologize and all that, you, and, know, you know, and I think that- Anybody can call somebody a retard, you know, for that example I gave, but when it's your mom, right. you know what I mean? Like, yeah, just, <laughs> we don't realize as mothers, and I'm sure dads too, how important what we say is everybody else in the world can say this and that but when you say it right it can hurt a thousand that, times more because it's you right you become their inner voice and so with my oldest being a preteen now she's become more sensitive so I really really have to be careful and mindful of what I say to her because she takes things to heart more of all the you know, the preteen of trying to like figure yourself out, self-identity <laughs> and all the hormones and all that stuff. So I really have to be more mindful of what I say to her because she can internalize it and, you know, it become her inner voice and stuff. So I tried to like the other day she came out of the, um, when she was getting out of the car, when I was dropping her off at school, she said the S word. <laughs> and I thought it was funny, but as a parent, you can't laugh at that. So I just, stared at her I'm like we'll talk about this when you get out of school and when she closed the door I was laughing <laughs> called my husband <laughs> and it's like oh this is what happened and then she felt so bad she wrote me a note and everything Aww. in second period telling me how sorry she was and stuff and I told her I'm like you know mistakes happen when she got he got back in um, when I picked her up and I, I appreciate your apology, but just don't do it again. You know what I mean? You're still learning. You're going to make mistakes. You're still a child. Like, just don't do it again. <laughs> yeah. So, like, I'm trying. Because I don't want her internal voice to be negative like mine was. So. I wrote yeah. my mom a letter <laughs> one time and apologizing. And I was... Oh my God, it was so horrible. I just had tears everywhere fly because <laughs> one time in my life, I attempted to steal something and I got caught oh. and the lady said, you either go home and tell your parents what you did and have them call me or I'm going to call the police. And so I'm writing this letter and it takes me all day and I'm bawling and bawling because oh. I can't go tell her I'm so upset that I write this long letter. And she, they read, my mom, my stepdad read it. And actually I did get compassion that day. And uh, I told my husband, he's like, well, I'm glad you got it once at least. And because <laughs> they said, we can tell by your letter, you feel really bad. Like you really beat yeah. yourself up. But my older sister was stealing stuff all the time. She's getting new clothes. She would go in the dressing room, put new clothes on, and then put her old clothes back and walk out. She had all these, new all these new clothes. And I'm working 50 cents an hour buying my clothes. And I can't get nice ones, right? And uh, my internet, it's unstable. 
Are you still there? Okay, just said unstable. We'll go. Yes, I'm still here. Yeah, you were okay. fading in and out. Okay, I'm still okay. here. <laughs> okay. And um, so I after so my sister's doing that and I'm not doing that. I'm being the good kid, working for my clothes. And um, but a friend of mine uh was at, we were at this store, like a Ben Franklin's um up the street from our house. And she said she steals stuff all the time, like little things, makeup and whatever. And she says, just try it. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm scared. And so I was <laughs> no good at this. And so I kept looking around, looking around. She says, you can't do that. You just got to casually put it in your pocket and go out. She says, you're taking too long. You're drawing attention to yourself. And I'm looking around like it's so long that the lady at the store and this other person at the store works there are watching me. And I know they're watching me, right? <laughs> and I'm like nervous. And so finally I just put it in my pocket. And the moment I did, because they're watching, they come over and it was the eyelash curler. And, oh. uh, and and that's what they told me. And so I was just like, I never stole again. I mean, I learned my lesson. <laughs> yeah. And, and, but my, my sister, she continued to get all kinds of stuff. I'm like, never, never, never again. But so I know what that's <laughs> like to write that letter to your mom. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I try to be as compassionate with them and put myself in their shoes and stuff. And that's that's how I parent like I know some people might say oh you're too soft or whatnot but you know to me sensitivity is a strength it's not a weakness I remind to put I, yourself... I admire soft parents because you know yeah. even with my grandkids I watch my kids and they're so patient and they're so kind and I'm thinking I don't know if I would put up that back talk I don't know. We are like, where's this head? <laughs> I'm thinking. And then they handle everything with such kindness and love, you know, that I didn't grow up with. And so I just love seeing my kids be such good parents. It's just like the most rewarding thing in the world. It seems <laughs> like, you know, as long as we try and be better than the parents we had, and then, you know, I mean, yeah. you're young yet, but when you see your kids, our parents and you see they're better than you ever were. It's just a very rewarding experience. I mean, a very good feeling because, you know, you would like to think, Oh, I taught them that, or I taught them that and I do see some things. But they're, <laughs> they're way better than I was. They're more patient. And that's what I try more. to tell them. I want you guys to be better than I was. So, <laughs> sorry. You got that off. I no, thought you were fine. done. I apologize. No, you're fine. <laughs> Yeah, that's what we want for But yeah, I just try. Mm -hmm. Well, it's been really nice talking to you. I'm sorry, I probably got you all off topic. Was there anything you wanted oh, to cover yeah. that you didn't get to? Um, thinking, no, I think I got all the bases and everything of my experiences and whatnot. So I appreciate you very much. And I'm honored to be on your show, reading your bio. You know, I was a bit intimidated, like Dr. Oz and all that stuff. Ions. And oh. <laughs> so that was. Uh, it's all in the past. <laughs> I'm just grandma, great grandma, sitting here in Ohio at my house doing my thing. <laughs> I don't go off and do stuff anymore. So I just do yeah. it from right here. So I, I know I should have just let you talk and it would probably been more enjoyable for everybody. But um, I just had, you just sparked so much interest in me. Uh, the similarities <laughs> we have. Yeah. And, and I could not get it out of my head. I, I see this girl doing a podcast. And I bet <laughs> she thinks she can't do it. But I'm telling you, I can see her doing it. How would it? I would actually uh, be open to that because I was thinking, like I said, was of writing a book of my experiences in childhood and stuff like that. That um, would be good too. But I would be very much open. That Thank you. <laughs> I'll help you with that too, if you like. Um, and I've had almost 400 guests. I'm, I've never said this to anybody that I could see do a podcast <laughs> or anything. But yeah, you should write that book when you're ready. I was 55 before I was ready. So That's awesome. Ready. But yeah, yeah. I'd like to help you. I'll uh I'll send this to you um when it's ready. It should be later tonight. And okay. um think about the podcast and let me know if you're interested and I'll do everything I can to help you because I know it can be scary. It's yeah. starting, <laughs> starting out and you don't know what to do. I had no clue. So 
If right. anybody else ever thinks about having a podcast, the first thing I recommend, and I'll say this just so everybody else can hear it, um, get online and make it a nonprofit before make you a start nonprofit? podcast. Make it a nonprofit. Make it a nonprofit. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So well, it's a I business when that. you start it up. And it'll, oh, and it'll be treated know. as a business. And there's a lot of perks with that. What are the investments um, for that to start the nonprofit? Oh, there's a little filing fee. Um, with your state, it'll be with your state. You'll go to your state, um, Secretary of State. Are you are you froze? Are you still with Sorry, me? you got cut off like you're okay. frozen in my yeah. screen. Um, whatever state you live in, go to your state, Secretary of State website. And mm -hmm. click on to start a business. I don't know if we still have internet. And um, it'll guide you through all the steps. And sit there with your printer when you do it. Print out, as they say, you'll need this, print it out. You'll need that, print it out. So when you're done, you have all the paperwork you need. And get that all filled. There's a little filing fee. And then they'll mail you a certificate saying this is a business. And then so um, when you start your YouTube you, when you fill out the paper, the online work for your channel, you're already established as a business. Oh, and um, so I mean, there's just perks. Um, you you need to pay if uh, you know when you go do your taxes, you're a nonprofit, so you can write off your electric, your internet, um, advertisement, your clothing, your I mean, there's a lot of things you know you you write off for a business. And so it makes it really easy to have oh, a awesome. business. Yeah. yeah. And that's all you got to do is on your taxes, it'll, and they'll give you the stuff when you do your tax, you click the thing that you have a nonprofit business and they give you all the paperwork and I can help you through it. Cause I was really intimidated and scared. I cried. I screamed a lot because I get so frustrated because I didn't understand. And so I'm really happy to help you. I would greatly appreciate that. Thank you. Uh -huh. You're welcome. So I'll send well, this out to you later today. All right. It was an honor, Peggy. Thank you so much for having me. It was Thank nice you. meeting you. You too. All right.